gold, burnt it with fire, and transposed it into powder, that doesn't work. You, you heat gold with fire or burn gold with fire, you get molten gold, you don't get powder. Nobody, it seems, thought to ask the question. They use this, it says, to make bread. They could mix it with frankincense, the Bible tells us, and mould little bread cakes, which the ancient, the most ancient Bible text that we have, the Septuagint, the, the old Greek Bible, calls bread of the presence, presumably bread of the presence of God or, or of something important. Shemana means firestone. This is a relief from that temple, another relief showing a bread presentation again. It was always linked with bread, they were always little conical shapes. We know that from about 2,500 BC, the pharaohs in Egypt, or the kings before they became pharaohs in Greek times, um, were ingesting the bread cakes of this white powder substance. Only the metallurgical adepts knew the secret of its manufacture. Metallurgical adepts, yep, it's made from metal, that makes sense. The high priest of the temples had a very strange title. The high priests of the Egyptian temples were called the great artificers. Well, a great artificer is, a, is a, a, a worker in materials, particularly metals. So that was sort of interesting. It's beginning to link together. And thinking back to Petri's concept, yeah, these were places of workship, not worship. Temples were not the same as churches that evolved from the concept. I actually looked in just the English language word etymological dictionary from Oxford University, which traces the origin of words, and lo and behold, I only had to go back 700 years to discover that the word we now use as worship had a K in the middle of it. It was workship. They used to work for the gods. They didn't used to worship the gods. They used to work for the gods, whoever the gods were. It was said that this was the food of the light body. They said, we all have bodies, but we don't just have physical bodies, we have light bodies. And just as we feed our physical bodies, they said, we have to feed our light bodies so that they will be nurtured and grow in, in the same way. They have to be as fulfilled as the physical body. And they call the light body the car. Well, it's interesting because scientists in recent times have actually called this material the light of life because it resonates with DNA on the same frequencies. It's a light wave. We find lots of references to Mufkut. Um, this relief here, this picture, uh, this drawing was actually done by the, the, the uh, Russian scholar Emmanuel Velikovsky. And he drew this up simply to give us an image of, of this relief at Karnak, at the Temple of Karnak. That sh this shows the treasures of, of the Pharaoh Tutmosis, the um, third. Mufkut in e Egyptian law was always portrayed as a cone shape. Now these things sit there in the gold section. Um, and it says underneath, these are gold, but we call them bread. 1450 BC, roughly, Tuthmosis founded uh, uh, at this temple at Karnak uh, a college, an institute at the temple of, of, of scholarly, priestly types who were called the Great White Brotherhood. The Alexandrians wrote of them and said they were called the Great White Brotherhood because they were absolutely obsessed with a mysterious white powder. And they made some interesting comments. They said that they call it the Paradise Stone, and it has unique qualities in as much as that it can weigh far more than its own original quantity of gold. But even a feather can tip the scales against it. So it can be a lot heavier than the gold it came from, or it can be lighter than a feather. This stuff has the ability to change its weight very, very dramatically. It's always, in the old text, associated with light, with enlightenment, with illumination of some sort. It's, it's a light illumination that seems to have to do with the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom, that, that sort of illumination and enlightenment. They're activating bits of our system now with this material that never seemed to have any purpose before. Why? 
do we only use a fraction of our brain power? Why don't we use the rest? Well, it's there to be used if we knew what to do with it. We need the trigger. We need the unlocking device. These materials are it. They're what was used to feed the car, the light body, to, to give anti-aging, to, to restore the youth, to take the pharaohs into the afterlife or whatever. There's an institute in um, Switzerland called the Alpha Learning Institute. The chief research director there is a fellow called Sean Adam. Sean Adam for 10 years has been the world's memory and speed reading champion. He can read a 300 book in 24 minutes. He reads at a speed of 3,850 words a minute. Uh, not only can he do all of that, he remembers it all and he can be tested on anything. He's also got his joint holder of the sixth highest IQ ever recorded. So th this guy has, has been running with others this research institute for the longest time which is linked up to government and corporate institutions and they specialize in learning difficulties in behavioral patterns and behavioral difficulties any, anything that, that might be linked to behavioral science uh, uh, along to finding cures for dyslexia ADHD learning deficiencies you know things of that sort and they're the primary institute in the world for fronting these things well from October 2002 until January 2003, a, uh, a little three to four month period there, they decided to test monatomic elements. Ten volunteers, five male, five female, average age somewhere between 17 and 52. And they were fed um, simply orally with these materials, with uh, monatomic elements, these powders, regularly and irregularly, just to test the reaction. Well, the results were, in their words, staggering. Sean Adam, he wrote, what we are seeing here is really quite amazing. The tests show it to be highly effective. The effect is immediate and cumulative. What they do here is, is to work on brainwave patterns and they try to synchronize uh, these things and they found that this material could do it. The theory and the logic behind it is that, that better balancing between left and right brain produces, and these are their words, a greater intelligence, enhanced creativity, improved mind-body coordination, more agility and less stress. Well, okay, that makes sense. If we're operating as we should be, that's what we should have. But we're, none of us really operating as we should be. We're operating with all of this left brain uh, thing going and not too much of the right. Well, here are the charts here these are just average charts there are hundreds and hundreds of these they took everybody's brainwave scans as they were they were going along now the top chart sh shows a, a normal starting base where in effect and this would be any one of us at any moment in time the brainwaves coming off the left side were far outweighing those the red ones on the the right hand side of the brain the effects they say is immediate and cumulative at the bottom is the first immediate effect what happens is that the left has now contracted back to meet the right, and they both, and the right's grown just a little bit, but they've absolutely synchronized. The left and the right brain of this person, and this is the immediate effect, has now begun. And then they say it's cumulative, because what then happens is that it all grows to where the blue one was at the beginning. Quite extraordinary. Our research clearly shows that the left-right brain imbalances predominate in many mental behavioral dysfunctions, such as dyslexia and ADHD. It is our professional opinion that the monatomic products would be of tremendous benefit in any of these conditions. It is the most obvious answer as a healthy alternative to chemicals that have harmful side effects. To that, Sean Adam, the director, adds, if I were going to take an exam, mental or physical, I would take monatomic elements immediately beforehand. 